Okay, great. So I'm, my name is Megan, and I'm also one of the Palliative Care Fellows, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shelley Garoni, who is a, a colleague and mentor to me and many other people here in this room. Um, she's currently at Kaiser Permanente in North Valley, so in Roseville and Sacramento since 1999. She is the um, uh, assistant physician in chief there overseeing things such as palliative care, elder care, quality, um, and also has definitely an interest in teaching um, us fellows and colleagues more about palliative care and also providing excellent um, counseling and palliative care herself. Um, she, uh, her road to there has gone through uh, Tulane University for medical school, um, internal medicine residency here in uh, UC Davis, and a pulmonary fellowship at Cedar sinai So please join me in welcoming uh, Shelley Garoni. Thank you so much for allowing me to spend the day here. Um, I feel a little bit just overwhelmed. Uh, it is wonderful to see so many community dwellers wanting to come and learn about these things. I think that Jack and Nathan and I have talked a lot, especially with the fellows, about how do we get this information out to the people that it matters the most, which is you. Because what we find with physicians, um, and Jack's right, physicians are actually pretty simple. We, we, we pretend that we're not, but we're really pretty simple. And so black and white is great, gray, not so hot. And um, we really follow your lead. So when you come to me and you say, hey, I have this, this post form, doc, or hey, doc, um, what is that really going to get me? That's important. It really helps us. We're going to switch gears a little bit now. We've spent the first two lectures talking about you as patient, or maybe someone you love as patient, but the patient perspective. How am I going to live? How am I going to tell my story? How am I going to make plans? But as Dr. Myers pointed out, when we get ill, everybody around us gets ill also. It is my body that might be sick, but my husband will feel pain. My family will feel, fear, will, will feel fear. My friends will be worried. And if I'm terminally sick, when I die, they all will grieve. Well, I mean, I, I might have one or two that don't grieve. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, might, they might high five. But <laughs> really, though, right, it is, it is those around us that live our illness with us. So we want to talk about what, it does, what does it mean to be a caregiver? Because as I tell my patients, once I have that body comfortable, my patient's body, my job changes. My job then goes to the caregivers. And it is so interesting to me to, to sit with caregivers at bedside and have caregivers apologize for crying. And I tell them, I kind of expect that. I worry about the ones who don't cry. And when I point out that it is actually the hardest position to be the caregiver, because I'm the doctor, I've got my white coat and my cape and, and my toys and my tools, and my patient has got the blue dress. Are they still blue at Davis? They're blue at Kaiser. They're backless. They're airy. <laughs> but the patient has very concrete things to focus on. The caregiver is in the hardest position of the three of us. The caregiver has the hardest job. And so we want to talk a little bit about what it is to be a caregiver. I truly believe there's a special place in heaven for caregivers. I really think there is. And I point that out to them all the time. We want to talk about what's normal for our caregivers and ways to cope. I've tried to just give you a comparison and contrast of what caregiving feels OK and what caregiving doesn't feel OK. The caregiving that feels OK is the stuff that we kind of take for granted. Feeding an infant, potty training a toddler, attending to a young one's boo-boo, paying for college, right? Those things kind of feel normal to us. We expect those things. We all know we're going to, um, what did you say, Dr. Fairman, get more seasoned? Um, we're going to get older. But it's, it's human behavior for us to not think about that. It's human behavior for us to think that I'm going to be who I am indefinitely. I'm just going to be Shelly. I'm going to be able to wipe my own tush. I'm going to be able to feed myself. I'm going to be able to pick my clothes and get dressed. We don't think about what it might be to actually need care. 
And so caregiving that doesn't feel okay is watching one of our elders struggle to swallow or our demented loved one forget how to swallow completely and drool and have food fall out of his mouth. What doesn't feel okay is changing a spouse's, I love this, this, this misnomer, adult incontinence product. I love going to Target, adult incontinence products. That sounds no better to me than adult diaper, frankly. And none of us want to think about being back in diapers. And, you know, I tease my husband all the time that the day he needs one, he's moving back with his son. <laughs> His poor son, payback, right? It's not okay to watch the aftermath of a hip fracture because they're devastating injuries. It's not okay to pay for room and board at a nursing home. Care for somebody who is towards end of life feels very different than care of our children, right? The care that feels okay feels temporary. Now, if your children are like mine, it's temporary until they're 30. But still, <laughs> it ends at some point, right? Care that doesn't feel OK feels endless. It feels permanent. And usually, the final outcome is something that is really, really painful. Either the death of our loved one, financial devastation, I have watched so many families struggle with this type of caregiving. And that's why there is a special place in heaven for caregivers. This is really hard. And I tell caregivers all the time, this is the hardest job you will ever do in your life. And if we can help you through it, it will be the most meaningful job you will ever do in your life. We're going to go through what my families have, have shared with me through my years in the field. It is very common for my caregivers to have tremendous anger. And it's so funny because I, I tease physicians that I think overall we are pretty conflict adverse. And so you can watch physicians hiding in the corner when there's a really pissed off family member. Because it's normal to be angry. And what I find most commonly is that caregivers first are angry at themselves. But it is also really normal to be angry at the patient, especially if that patient made choices in their life that might have contributed to where we are today. I remember dealing with a patient who was a former IV drug abuser, now with end-stage liver disease, young man. And I didn't have my face to him. I was putting something in his chart in the computer, and I heard him look at his family and said, I am so sorry for being such a shithead. And without turning around, I said, did I just hear you refer to yourself as a shithead? And he said, well, yes, you did. And I said, but you have these lovely people sitting here who clearly adore you. Do you think your description is actually accurate? Because if your description is accurate, I don't think they would be here sitting at your side. So it is normal to be angry at ourselves, to be angry at our patient, our loved one. It is normal if you have any sense of spirituality or thinking that there's a God or thinking that there's a heaven. It's normal to be angry at that entity. It's OK. And it's OK to own the anger and to try and work our way through it. My families have told me that they have tremendous guilt. I have seen caregivers rake themselves over the coals. I should have recognized the symptoms. How could you? I should have done something different. What would that have looked like? I should have made him stop. One of my colleagues just had a son die of an overdose. And he said, I should have done something different. His son was 19. His son had every right to check himself out of the hospital the day before he died, and he did. My poor colleague could do nothing different, but the guilt racked him. I should have done something different. And it's interesting to me to watch a human brain, because when a human brain starts into what I should have done, we go from things like I should have said something, done something, been something, save world hunger, create world peace. I mean, our brains just go into craziness. And, and it's important to catch that. Or if I catch you, to stop. 
because we can drive ourselves completely mad in the guilt. I do think there are things around guilt of, did I get so tied up in making ends meet? Did I get so tied up in trying to set rules for the children? Did I get so tied up in my workaholism? I do have workaholism, by the way. Did I get so tied up that I missed the important things to say I love you, to say I'm sorry, to say, yeah, let's take that trip? What I will ask of you if you're a caregiver finding yourself in guilt is then to forgive yourself and let go of it. My caregivers have frank desperation. What do you mean this diagnosis is permanent? What do you mean she's going to die? How, how is that possible? How did we get here? It's human behavior to think that we are either going to live forever or we're just going to live as we are until we don't wake up one day. That's normal human behavior. And so when we have to all of a sudden face something huge, we become desperate. And it goes, again, to everything. So silly story, I was a med student. I went to school at Tulane in New Orleans, and my lung popped. I was getting dressed for school, my lung popped. So being me, I have, a, I have an exam. I drive myself to school. I'm walking a mile and a half to school from the parking lot. Can't breathe, turning green. My classmates are looking at me like, ooh, something's wrong with her. And I walk into the dean's office, and the dean said, what the hell are you doing here? I said, I don't feel good. And he said, well, you don't look good, thank you. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I, you, we need to get you over to the ER. I said, no, I have a test. He said, Shelly, you have to go to the ER. I said, I, need, I have a test. He said, screw the test, you're going to the ER, right? So this, this whole thing happens. We, our brain just gets locked into the task of what I need to do. That's normal. I see desperation a lot. I see frustration a lot. Frustration and anger to me are kind of similar things, but frustration around there is something you can do. We've heard about all of this cool technology and amazing medical advances. Why can't you do something, doctor? Why do I have to feel so crummy? I spoke with a lady on the phone yesterday, avid golfer, tennis player, and now she gets short of breath walking 10 steps. She's very frustrated, and her husband's frustrated. And I see a lot in caregiving, especially if it's a big family, one or two people take on the burden of the care, and the others don't. And so there's huge frustration around, where are my siblings, right? I see bewilderment. I don't even know where to begin. I, I don't know what to think. How can, how can we possibly talk about you not being here one day? I, 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 can't, I can't imagine that. Again, my poor husband has to turn on our television. I have no idea how to do that. And he has guys, right? So I don't know who the FedEx guy is. I don't know who the laundry guy is. He's got guys. I can't manage the sprinklers. I, I don't know. I would be so overwhelmed if I lost him. And there's just this tremendous sadness in my caregivers. Even if the body that they are living with, the loved one they are living with, is not yet dying, but it is desperately sick, so my lady who could only walk 10 steps, her husband on the phone, you could hear this desperate sadness. The woman I married can't be the woman I married anymore. I miss that woman. We see this all the time in dementia because the caregivers of the demented are watching that loved person die a little bit every day. They lose something new every day. And it's really difficult, and it's really sad. How do I get out of bed? How do I eat? I mean, you know, it's so interesting to me. I've spoken to caregivers who say, you know, I, I went to the grocery store, and those people were just shopping like nothing was wrong. Well, for them, nothing was wrong. Your world has imploded. You are desperately sad. I expect that. I worry about the ones who don't cry. And we talk a lot with my families how emotion is wave-like. It comes and goes. It has a tidal pull. And with luck, it eases up week after week, year after year. But even years later, 
a particular smell, a particular thought, the look of a dog, can set somebody into tears. My colleague that I mentioned whose son died, one of the most stoic men I've ever met. And he looked at me and he said, I've never cried before. I don't think I like it. <laughs> I appreciate that. And he's still going to cry at random periods, probably for years. There is abject terror. If nothing else, just having to come in and put on a blue dress or watch your loved one in a blue dress is not so comfortable. It's a little bit scary. But this whole thing of being permanently sick and having to consider dying forces us to consider the very essence of what it is to be. Does any of this really matter? Is there life after death? Do I think that something else exists? Was all of this for nothing? It forces us to absolutely question the very essence of humanity and the very essence of being alive. So to Dr. Fairman's point, why don't I want to look at my story? It's absolutely terrifying sometimes, right? The planning part isn't scary. The meaning of what I'm looking at is a little scary. What I've seen, so I've, what, those are the things I've heard, but what I've seen in my caregivers is lots of losses. I've watched my caregivers lose health. I had a patient last year, he was dying. His wife was a type 1 diabetic, refusing to take her insulin, refusing to treat her foot infection. That would have been fatal for her. And sometimes you'll see me be a little bit rough with my families. Not in a mean way, but I kind of got in her face and said, you will do these things. I need you to not lose your health. I need you to not lose weight. I don't know how many family members I've spoken to who say, yeah, this is a great diet. If you're going for weight loss, it's just the way to do it. That also is not healthy. I have sent more than one caregiver to the ER in my career because they fainted from low sugar and dehydration. It's critical that our caregivers take care of their body. I have seen my caregivers lose purpose. My whole purpose on the planet was to love this man and care for this man. And now that this man has the gall to get sick and die, what is my purpose? I contend that you are on the planet, therefore you have a purpose. And it probably is something in addition to loving and caring for that man or that woman. And to that point, I see caregivers lose vision of who they are and why they matter, lose their own sense of self. Caregivers, I think, are at risk of losing their community. This is so overwhelming and so terrifying, and I don't want people to see me cry, and, 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 I, and, and I just need to stay positive, that I see my caregivers lose those very folks around them who could be of support and assistance, even if it's nothing more than let's go get a cup of coffee, let's go for a walk, go take a nap. We need our caregivers to keep their community. And I have watched my caregivers completely lose themselves. And to me, that is the most tragic thing. If I have ever failed at my job, it is because I didn't get a caregiver to find his or herself in the midst of what was going on in front of them. I will tell you that that is where my focus goes. As soon as my patient's body is comfortable, if it's a dying body, I go back to my caregiver because I need my caregiver to realize that hearts break open. They do not break apart, and that caregiver will not cease to be. That caregiver is important in and of him or herself. I agree with Jack. I think miracles do happen. I think that what we get probably is not what we ask for. One of the favorite deaths that I ever attended was a 16-year-old. Her name was Katie. 
I met Katie, and I think it, that her clinical team called me in more just to see, I think it was a dare. You know, let's see what Shelly can do. Katie had cancer in her bones, all of her bones. And it was riddling her spine. So Katie was in agonizing pain with this cancer in her spine. And I got called in to see if I could get her pain under control. Now, I don't know what it is about me, but I actually do see dying people. And so when I went in and I met Katie, it was very clear to me she was dying. And I went out and I found her doctor and I said, I can get her pain under control. I'm not worried about that, but she's dying. Do we have a plan? Because frankly, Katie's mama is not going to be able to handle this very well. Katie's 16. I would expect mama to not be able to handle this very well. And the doctor looked at me and she said, oh, Katie has no exit clause. And I looked at the doctor and I said, I'm sorry, what? And she said, Katie has no exit clause. I said, I don't understand what that means. And she said, well, her cancer's in her bones. It's not in her organs. She's 16. She's really young with healthy organs. She could live a long time yet. And again, I see dying people. It's just a thing I do. And, um, and I don't tell you because I don't scare you. But... <laughs> But I, I knew, I knew Katie was dying. And so I, I humored the doctor and I said, okay, fine, let's, let's treat her pain. And I met Katie on a Friday. When I went in Monday, the nurse told me that Katie was hallucinating. I didn't think Katie was hallucinating. I thought Katie was dying. And she was. And so I went to my chaplain and I said, I need your help. Katie's parents are divorced. Mom is not going to be able to handle this. There's no way. It's okay. Mama doesn't have to handle this. But I need Dad ready to midwife Katie into heaven because it's getting close. So can you come help me? So that afternoon at 3 o'clock, we went into Katie's room. I sat at bedside with Mama. We made small talk. Katie was unconscious. Dad and the chaplain sat in the corner. I didn't get to hear their conversation, but I know they were talking about this impending death and what it might look like. Now, Katie is completely unconscious. And all of a sudden, she opened her eyes and she did this. No one said a word. And I'm looking at that going, that was so cool. No one said a word. And I'm looking around, and no one says a word. I'm like, really? Because that was kind of cool. OK, fine. We're not going to talk about it. So mom and I continue to make small talk. We're at the bedside. Katie's unconscious. Dad and the chaplain are in the corner. And the next thing Katie does is she does this. And then brings her hand back down. Now dad says something. Dad says, what is she doing? The doc was in the room as well with the chaplain and dad. And the doc, who didn't believe Katie was dying, was very cute because she says, I don't know, but it kind of looks like the Sistine Chapel. I had to think about that one. Oh, OK, yeah, Sistine Chapel, I get it. And I said, she's talking to the other side. I don't understand how this works, but it's very clear to me Katie's talking to the other side. And it's very clear to me Katie's OK. Mom didn't say anything to me through any of this, of this discourse. We left the room. Katie apparently woke up three hours later. The room was full of people. She was one of many siblings. I don't even know how many children were in Katie's family. So all of her siblings were there. Mom was there. Dad was there. Adult friends were there. Katie looked at Mom and said, Mama, Aunt Isabel's here. And she wants me to tell you she loves you. Mama started crying because Isabel had died 20 years prior. Katie never knew her. Katie looked at dad's friend and said, your daddy's here, but I can't say his name. And the friend started crying and said, my dad is dead. And he spoke to Golig, so he wouldn't be able to say his name. Katie named another four or five dead people who were in the room and talked about how glad she was that they were there. And then she went unconscious again and died three hours later. Mama didn't handle the death well, as we can expect. Mama jumped up and down on the bed trying to call a code. Katie's siblings were the ones who pulled Mama back off the bed and said, Mom, she told you where she was going. She told you who was here with her, and she told you who was escorting her. She's OK. Now it's your turn to get OK. I think that our loved ones will take care of the caregivers. I truly believe that. I have watched it time and time and time and time again. That's why I do this job, because spirits are awfully cool to watch. They take care of the caregivers, which means I need the caregivers to take care of themselves as well.
So how do you do that? How do you cope as a caregiver? How do you take care of yourself? Well, the first thing is to be forgiving. And the first person to forgive is yourself. It is so normal for caregivers to say, I should have, I could have, I would have, had I known, I, the coulda, shoulda, woulda. Let it go. We are where we are today. Be patient with yourself. Be gentle with yourself. I have so many family members tell me I would never have made it go this way or let that decision happen had I known. And the response is, every decision you have made to date makes perfect sense for the information you had at the time. It's okay. I'm not worried about how we got to this point in time. Let's focus from this point in time and move forward. Tell me what would matter now. Tell me what's important now. Tell me what the goal is now. And let's move forward. It's also important to forgive the one you love. So my gentleman who referred to himself as a shithead, his family had forgiven him years before. But sometimes we see that continuing to happen. If only he would have stopped smoking. If only he would have stopped drinking. If only he would have taken his meds. If only he would have exercised. If only, if only, if only. At this point, we can't do a darn thing about the if only. Let it go. It doesn't help you now. It just hurts. So forgive and let go. If you are at the bedside of someone who is dying and they are now unconscious, like Katie, they can hear you. Now, Dr. Fairman and, and Dr. McMillan and Dr. Myers and I can't study that. You can't get it past to kill people and bring them back and say, so what did you hear? <coughs> It'll never go. But we all have been in the field long enough, we've been in the practice long enough that we've watched patients hear things. We have watched families react in ways where it is clearly evident that spirit is listening. So even to the unconscious patient, you tell them what's important. If you need to ask for permission, you do. If you need to ask for forgiveness, you do. If you need to give forgiveness, you do. It doesn't matter whether they're awake or not. It's important to keep a notebook. We humans love to think that we can multitask. We all have smartphones now that lead us to believe we can. We cannot. Brains can do one thing at a time. And when you are in the midst of grief and caregiving and trying to manage your body and someone else's body, you can't possibly keep everything in that one brain of yours. So write it down. Right? It's important to jot down tasks as you hear about them. It's important to write down assignments, right? And it's important to write down clinical notes. There's lots of web-based applications now. I've watched people doing that to give updates to well-wishers. But write it down. I don't do well with delegation. I, something about being a workaholic, I don't know. But actually, caregivers really need to learn how to delegate. You are working on your own body and your loved one's body. That is ginormous. That is a huge task. So give yourself permission to say, if I can work on my body and my loved one's body, someone else can run the vacuum. This is the time when all of those well-wishers and friends and acquaintances have said, hey, call me if I can do anything. Call them. Send them to Rayleigh's. Make someone else do the dusting. It is human behavior that we want to help each other, but we don't know how. So that's why we say, call me if I can do anything. Give them jobs. And don't think twice about it. Hey, you, would you mind cleaning that bathroom? I personally, that's a task I'd love to hand off. <laughs> right? It's OK to hire a gardener. My grandmother is 88 years old. She's still living at home alone. She is stubborn as all hell. We tease her that she's going to die at 60 pounds and three feet tall. <laughs> she will not hire a gardener because no one can do it as well as her. Thank you very much. It's time for her to hire a gardener. Right. Ask for help with the housekeeping. And if you're having struggles financially, social workers have amazing knowledge. I don't know where social workers keep all of that knowledge in their brain. I'm not that smart. but. Find a social worker. There was reference earlier about sometimes being informed is the best way to go about things. 
I would agree with this. You will find that your palliative care specialist will start the conversation by asking you, how much do you want to know? Because we aren't going to force feed you information if you really don't want it. But what we have found is that families and, and caregivers who really want to know do better. They cope better. Bereavement is easier when all is said and done if they are better informed. Now, again, we docs are pretty simple, so we're going to follow your lead. I have had caregivers come to me and point blank say, you may say nothing negative in this room. And when there is nothing but badness clinically going down in that room and I can't say anything negative, what do you think I say? Nothing. There's nothing I can say, right? And so ask us. And it's OK to say, you know, either give it to me straight or give it to me in pieces. I had one patient who told me, I can't hear it, but tell her. She'll feed it to me at the, at the rate of the information that I can handle. Well, that's OK. And if you're the caregiver and that's how you need to process, that's fine. Can I have this one piece of information today? And sometimes the piece of information I need is, is, is he really going to die? And then I can't talk to you anymore today, Doc. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. That's OK. We'll follow your lead. We'll give you the information at the rate you need it. No physician wants to make you drink out of a fire hose and say, so how was that? Right? And don't lose your health. You are the caregiver. So if I lose my caregiver, the whole shebang falls apart. I don't get anything done because now I have a very sick patient and no one to care for that patient. I understand, especially if the, if the caregiver is in front of an actively dying patient, they can't eat. They're nauseous. That's okay. But do stay hydrated and drink things with sugar in them. Hydrating just with water doesn't help because your sugar's drop, you still hit the floor. All right, so stay hydrated and do something with, su with sugar and calories. Smoothies are fine, milkshakes are fine. If you're a lady, chocolate is always good. <laughs> Take care of your body. If you need medications, if you need treatments, if you need something for your own medical condition, do it. It doesn't help your loved one if I lose you. And then I think it's important to find some means of expression. Some folks are very verbal. They're able to express verbally. That's awesome. Some folks aren't so verbal. I put on tap shoes. I go stomp my feet, make a whole bunch of noise. I feel a whole a lot better. Express yourself. And do take breaks. I have dealt with many actively dying patients, well-meaning caregivers who sit vigil at the bedside, and they won't leave, and they keep staring at their loved one. Now, if you've ever had a child stare at you while you're sleeping, it feels freaky. <laughs> so if you're taking care of someone and they're sleeping, that's your time to go look at something else, right? It just freaks us out when someone's watching us sleep. If your loved ones can still get up to the bathroom, let them, because that's kind of private. Right? So take breaks. When I, and all of the time that I take care of actively dying patients, they're in my hospital, I'm always telling family, you have to leave the room. Every couple of hours, get out of the room. Go take a walk around. First, you just need to see something different. I don't know what color the Davis walls are anymore, but at Kaiser, they're all lovely light green. Yeah, you got to leave every now and then. Just see something different, right? It is important to remember when you are the caregiver that your loved one is actually worried about you. You're worried about your loved one, but in, in reality, they're not worried about themselves that much, especially as disease has progressed. They're worried about you. So it's critical that you take care of you. And then if your loved one is act actively dying, death is occurring in the coming minutes to hours or days, it's important to know that you may not be present for that last breath. I think the spirit chooses that time. And so if they choose the time when you are not there, they did that on purpose because they didn't want that to be your final memory. I don't know how many families I have had come back into the room, oh, I shouldn't have gone to pee. Yes, you should have. <laughs> Peeing on the floor is just embarrassing. They needed that time. 
They needed you to not see that last breath. It's okay. I've learned a few lessons. All of us have, right? Bodies die. Spirits do not. Bodies die. Love does not. Love will continue even after the death of the body. It feels different. It behaves differently. I can't tease my husband once he dies. Well, I will. He just won't laugh back at me, right? Hearts break open, but they do not break apart. I don't have caregivers going crazy. I just have them getting tremendously sad and then healing from that heartbreak. And that the time that the death occurs is way beyond my control. Dr. McMillan is right. Doctors stink at trying to predict when you're going to die. We can't. We just can't. So don't ask us. You can ask us about what's likely to happen, but I can't predict the moment, right? But you always have meaning. You always have purpose. And thank you to the caregivers because we need you. What questions do you have for me?